Today, I would like to talk about the preliminary concepts of the finite element method and how to combine the physics and mechanics of continuous bodies with vectors and tensors from calculus and derive the finite element formulation. The main focus will be structural mechanics with linear elastic materials. For example, for a given continuous body like a potato, I want to apply a load, fix some boundaries, and use the finite element method to see the mechanical deformation of this potato. The main question is, how to go from an undeformed shape to a deformed one like this. I will divide this topic into three separate videos. In the first part, I will have a quick review of vector and tensor calculus. In the second video, I will talk about the mechanics of continuous bodies for structural mechanics applications. Finally, in the last video, I will focus on the finite element method and how to derive finite element formulations from the mechanics of a body. Let's start with the vector. What is a vector? Vector is a finite collection of scalars. In this video, I will focus on the Cartesian vector, a Euclidean vector defined using Cartesian coordinates. For example, a 3D Cartesian vector U is defined as we can also use basis vectors to describe U. Basis vectors are defined as a set E of vectors in a vector space. If every element of the given vector may be written as a finite combination of elements of the basis vector. For example, for our U vector, we can define three basis vectors, E1, E2, and E3, as follows. Now, we can define the U vector as a linear combination of basis vectors E. To specify the elements of a vector or tensor, we could use a very helpful notation called index notation. With index notation, any vector or matrix can be expressed in terms of its indices. For example, we can express vector V in terms of its indices by VI, or a second order tensor A by AIJ. Another useful application of linear algebra to physics is Einstein notation, also known as the Einstein summation convention. This notation implies summation over a set of index terms in a formula when an index variable appears twice in a single term. For example, using index notation, we can describe AIBI as A1B1 plus A2B2 plus A3B3. Also, using this notation, we can define any vector like W as a summation over a set of bases and its elements. We can extend the index notation and summation convention to describe matrix multiplication. or to apply trace operator on a matrix to perform summation over the diagonals, or even a dot product of two vectors, where we perform summation over the corresponding entries of two vectors. We can also define a cross product of two vectors as Where E i j k is the permutation symbol, it is equal to 1 when i j k is an even permutation. It is equal to minus 1 when i j k is an odd permutation. Otherwise, it is equal to 0. We can also define the double dot product, where the resulting value will be scalar because of the Einstein summation over index i and j. You might ask how to do the Einstein summation over the dot product of two vectors. Let's assume we have two Cartesian vectors, u and v, defined based on their basis vectors. We can represent these two vectors as uiei and vjej, as you can see on the screen. Next, let's perform a dot product on these two vectors. We will end up with uivjeiej where we can define the dot product of two basis vectors with the Kronecker delta function. The Kronecker delta is equal to 1 if i equals j, otherwise, it's 0. Therefore, the dot product of u dot v is a scalar, and it will be ui vi where we can perform Einstein summation to get the scalar value. 
In summary, we can represent vector tensor products with tensor notation. For example, the vectors dot product or vector tensor dot products. The O times symbol represents the tensor or dyadic product. That increases the rank of the tensor, which I will talk about tensor rank in a few minutes. If we want to represent these products in index notation, it's going to be like this. For example, as I said, the dyadic product of two vectors gives a second order tensor. Or, we can even represent these in matrix notation, as we all know from linear algebra, which I will have a separate video series on mastering linear algebra with NumPy. Tensor What is a tensor? I would say a tensor is an extension of scalar, vector, and matrix. It is a multidimensional array on a given basis, and it is independent of any frame or reference. We can define a tensor by its rank, where the rank of a tensor is defined as the number of indices required to write down the components of the tensor. For example, a scalar will be rank 0, a vector is rank 1, and a matrix is rank 2. Or another example related to structural mechanics, the material tangent stiffness matrix is rank 4 which I will talk about it in future videos. Here, I am just summarizing some of the tensor operation rules and tensor dyadic product rules that you can find in any linear algebra textbook. Next, let's review the definition of symmetric and skew-symmetric tensors. A matrix or tensor is symmetric, if and only if it is equal to its transpose. It means all of its entries above the main diagonal are reflected into equal entries below the diagonal. On the other hand, a matrix is skew-symmetric if and only if it is equal to the negative of its transpose. We can decompose any tensor into symmetric and skew-symmetric tensors. For example, S is the symmetric part of tensor T defined as 1 half T plus T transpose, and W is the skew-symmetric part of T defined as 1 half T minus T transpose. Remember, the skew tensor has zero diagonal components. Another nice feature, if A is a symmetric tensor, then the double dot product of A and W will be zero. And the double dot product of A and T will be the same as A and S. Here. I am giving another example of decomposing a second order tensor into symmetric and skew symmetric tensors. It's called the displacement gradient, which we will use to develop the strain tensor. Physically, the displacement gradient shows the tangent vector to describe the relationship between the undeformed and deformed configurations. If we decompose the displacement gradient tensor, the symmetric tensor is called the strain tensor which we are going to use a lot in this video series. Its skew-symmetric tensor is called the rotation tensor. You can find this definition in any continuum mechanics textbook. Next, I want to give you a short review on gradient, Laplace, divergence, and curl operators. For these operators, we basically apply the del operator to various kinds of functions. For example, this is the definition of the gradient operator, which results in a vector field. If we apply the gradient operator on a scalar field, the rank will increase by 1, giving a vector. Likewise, applying the gradient operator on a vector field will result in a second order tensor. For example, here is the proof. This is the definition of the Laplace operator in which we apply divergence on the gradient operator, which I am going to talk about divergence in a moment. Divergence is another del operator that operates on a vector or tensor field and produces a scalar field. For example, this is the definition of applying divergence on the stress tensor. I will talk about this and how to use the divergence theorem in the mechanics of continuum bodies. This is the definition of the curl operator. And finally, I want to write down the definition of integration by parts 
that we will use in the mechanics of the continuum bodies to derive the weak form from the strong form of equations. All right, this is the end of the video. Thank you for supporting the channel. If you haven't, please subscribe to the channel for upcoming exciting videos and give thumbs up for videos.